Welcome everybody. Um, if everybody could just keep their mics on mute for the session just to prevent any of the, the background noise that we get. Uh, we will have a question and answer session uh, towards the end, but feel free to pop questions in the chat as we as we go through the presentations as well. So I'm just going to share my screen here to get our intro slides up. Imagine we'll have a few more people joining. <clears throat> And just so everybody knows the session is being recorded as well. Um, we can use it as an educational resource for people that can't make it today. Um, as I mentioned, dedicated question and answer session towards the end, which we'll do, but feel free pop questions in the chat box as we're going through. Um, but just as a quick introduction, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Raj Bethapudi in a sec, but um, my name's Jack. I'm the project delivery lead for CVD prevention employed by North East North Cumbria ICB, um, supporting various different projects which uh, improve the detection and management of the APC conditions for CVD prevention. Um, but I will hand over to Dr. Raj Bethapudi now just to go through a few introductory slides before we hand over to Dr. Andrew Richardson, who's going to be doing the main session today, which is going to be around the CDRC tools specific for EMIS. So I'll hand over to you, Raj. Thanks very much, Jack. Uh, hello and good afternoon. Uh, uh, as Jack mentioned, uh, I'm the CBD prevention lead for Northeastern North Cumbria, and I am joined by, apart from Jack, two clinicians, Andy and Georgina, who are the place-based clinical leads for supporting practices in improving the detection and prevention work for CBD. So next slide, please. My slides will be just to set the context and as to why this is so important. Uh, the first thing is all of us work to the NHS long term plan and long term plan identifies CBD as a clear priority. A uh, CBD and cancer are the two biggest priorities on the long term plan and uh, we want to reduce the number of strokes and heart attacks by 150,000 over the next 10 years. And prevention forms the key basis for it, which is the reason why everybody who is present here today, your work is very, very important because if that goal has to be achieved, then the building blocks start from primary care and therefore each and every one of your role is so very important in achieving that. Next slide, please. So what are the key priorities for CBD prevention in Northeast and North Cumbria? Uh, it's very similar to the NHS England's priorities. The first thing is system leadership. Uh, people in this room probably know how important it is to have that overall system leadership to make sure that we have the, shamed, the, the same shared values, vision and ethos to achieve the, the outcomes that we set out for ourselves. The biggest challenge is the whole variation. That's the biggest problem. If the biggest challenge we were to fight against, it is the variation. We know that two practices in the same postcode have completely different outcomes and uh, the number of uh, patients on the registers, they can be very, very different. And that in itself is a challenge. So addressing that variation is one of the key targets and that the work that is currently being undertaken by the clinical leads very much underpins that theme, targeting that unwarranted variation. ABC, airway breathing circulation for CBD is atrial fibrillation, blood pressure and cholesterol in no particular order, but blood pressure is very, very, very much the key risk factor, as we all know. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping I'm not preaching to the converted, but we all know how important the diagnosis of ABC at a very early stage is if we were to achieve those outcomes that we set out for ourselves. The next one is accelerating, making every contact count. And again, this is where this, the whole system effect comes into play. A whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So every single role, be it your additional role, social prescribers, 
pharmacy technicians, pharmacists, uh, people who screen for foot pulses, and of course, the primary care team, GPs, practice nurses, everyone's role is so vitally important. And what are the uh, prevention targets? We want at least 77% of patients on hypertension registers to be treated to target. On the positive side, Northeastern North Cumbria is at the leading ICB in the country to, to hit those targets. We are around about 71, 71.5 at the moment, but we want to, that's, that's not enough. We want to go 77 and of course, much beyond that. The second target is to ensure that at least 60% of the patients who have a Q risk score between the age group of 25 and 84 are on a statin. The reason why it's not 10%, I know that primary care is now working to a 10% target, but the, the, the rationale behind that being, if you hit that 20%, then you're hitting your high risk first. So you're pretty much prioritizing your workload. But if you're working to a 10% target, that's absolutely fine, but make sure that the 20% and greater Q risk score are the people who are addressed because they are on the higher priority list. And of course, we all know that post COVID, we have learned that the core 20 plus five population has been the worst affected. They were the ones who had the majority deaths and therefore this work very much underpins the core 20 plus five approach, which is targeting those people in the higher centiles of deprivation. Because by that way, if you're if you're tackling that group, you're very much directly hitting the nail on the head. You are tackling unwarranted variation. You are tackling your CBD priorities. Next slide, please, Jack. So I'm not going to get too much into the details of the governance and all of that, but uh, those are the key people. Uh, uh, the good thing is we are linked up as a system. Uh, the ICB chair, Neil O'Brien, the executive medical director, the medical directors in place are connected. Uh, the public health uh, directors are connected. And of course, we've got the buy-in from NHS England as well. So we've got the right uh, leadership uh, on this program. Next slide, please. So it looks a very busy slide, but very much summarizes what I've said. Uh, system, system leadership, ABCs of general practice, targeting unwarranted variation and making every every contact count. So this is a little bit more detail to what I've just said, um, but I think uh, to contextualize the importance of today's session, Andy has got some wonderful hints and tips as to how to make your life easy and therefore uh, following that will help you achieve these goals in a much, much easier manner. Next slide, please. So there you go. As I just mentioned, that's that's the small team we have. Um, Catherine is the most most latest edition where who, who's our pharmacist lead, and uh, she is doing a lot of training with PCN pharmacists, PCN pharmacy technicians. So if you think there are a, there's a cohort of your pharmacists or pharmacy technicians who could improve their knowledge on CBD detection and prevention, then Catherine is your person. Just send an email to Jack. Likewise, if you feel that your practice could do with a bit more support and input as to how to make life easy on the CBD prevention, by all means, drop a line to Jack and we're more than happy to facilitate some sessions for you. Next slide, please. There you go. Yeah, I, th I think, yeah, we can just move on to the next slide, please. So risks and challenges, like everything else, CBD comes with its own risks, funding, you know, that's the elephant in the room. I know we're all kind of in our own programs of work, funding is a big issue. The scale of the challenge, we are the biggest ICB in the country. So, uh, you know, we are trying our best, but it's a huge challenge, particularly with the high levels of deprivation we've got in, in the Northeast, uh, Hartlepool, Stockton, Middlesbrough, Sunderland, uh, Newcastle West. There, there's uh, some real, real big pockets of deprivation. So, so the, the scale of the challenge is huge. Uh, variation, as we've talked about, workforce, we know general practice is really stretched. Uh, that said, I think if you are clever about it, we can use the new roles to, to achieve our outcomes, uh, your social prescribers, health and well-being coaches, first contact practitioners. In fact, everyone can be instrumental in, in, in the uh, detection and prevention of CBD. Uh, data, yeah, keeps changing. So what is uh, a struggling practice today is not the same tomorrow. 
and vice versa. So to keep on top of data is certainly a challenge. Uh, there's of course there's a whole load of you know uh, moving uh, it's a moving phase the whole way the system is working the clinical networks how do they become mainstream or what are the changes in NHS England and ICBs change in government you know all of these PCNs where do these stand there's a lot of uh, moving forms at the moment so so there is uh, a little bit of uncertainty around that as well next slide Jack so Jack over to you to give a just a brief overview of the CBD prevent data. Brilliant. Thanks, Raj. Um, so yeah, I don't really want to take away from what Andy's doing today. So it's just a quick um, mention on CBD prevent, really. So some of you might have seen it before, some of you might have used it, but CBD prevent is a is a data tool which anybody can access. You can literally just Google CBD prevent. First link that comes up, I'll pop it in the chat as well. Um, and it allows you to look at various CVD prevention relevant indicators, particularly across the ABC conditions, which we've been talking about um, from a ICB level, from a regional, from England level, from a practice level down to between PCNs and practices. Um, this is all freely available data. Anybody can look at it and it's useful to, you know, look at how you're doing within a PCN. So you can look within your PCN how the other practices are doing. Um, you can look at obviously over an area as well to do how the whole of your area is doing um, and it really helps drive potential improvement opportunities potentially let's say if you're looking at your hypertension treatment to target it might be that you could be the highest in the PCN or the lowest in the PCN from that it can help you either share learning if you're the highest or if you're the lowest what improvement work could be done um, for example, I've got just a couple of screenshots on the next slide, which are totally random. That's not specific to any practices in North East North Cumbria, to be honest, I don't think, apart from um, the first couple where we're looking North, Cum North East North Cumbria versus England. This is how it looks when you're on the website, various different graphs. First one in the left hand corner, you've got North East North Cumbria versus England. As Raj mentioned earlier, we do do very well on hypertension treatment to target. We are the best in the country. That's just over a time view there. Um, on the slide on the right, top right here, that is the ICBs across the North East North Cumbria. It hasn't got the labels on there. You do have to hover over them to see. Um, and then the top left, sorry, the bottom left, you've got some uh, PCNs across Doncaster, which are going to pick these totally random. Um, and the bottom right hand corner, you've got a view of practices within a PCN as well. So it does give you some useful data. As I mentioned, it is looking at those indicators across the ABC conditions, helps focus some target improvement work. However, the, the issue with the data is that it is, it is a bit behind. So the data that we have available at the moment is from GP Systems September 2023. So the data that you might have locally within your practice is likely to be more up to date and live. Um, but for people like ourselves, which are trying to address that variation across the North East and North Cumbria and, and hone down into it, it's really useful for us to look at. As I say, it might be useful for, for yourselves to look at as well, just to compare against other practices and other PCNs within your area. Um, but I'll stop there. Um, I'll pop the link in the chat so that people can have a look. And if people are interested in knowing more about CBD Pred, feel free to drop me an email. I've done sessions before with different clinicians to uh, give a bit of a demo, but there is demos on the website as well, which will talk you through how to operate it. It's fairly straightforward once you've had a little go. Um, and if anybody is interested in joining the CBD Prevention Network distribution list, do drop me an email as well. So you'll be kept up to date with the network events that we host, which are usually quarterly. We host different events and webinars like this as well, relevant to the CBD prevention agenda and program. Um, so. What we'll do is we'll hand straight over to Andy and we'll do a bit more of a dedicated question session towards the end. But as I say, keep feel free to pop them in a the chat. So Dr. Andrew Richardson is going to do a presentation on utilising the CDRC tools to support finding and treating the right patients that you need to around CBD prevention and among other various bits which will be helpful to for you to understand. So over to you, Andy. So can everyone see my presentation there? Yep, all good for me. Marvellous. So 
Yeah, I'm I'm one of the GP clinical leads for the Northeast and North Cumbria for CVD prevention, but I'm also a, a developed resources for the CDRC, uh, specifically within EMIS. So I'm in quite quite a lucky position to see how CVD prevention can be improved across Northeast and North Cumbria with my with my role with the ICB, but equally I can then think about the resources that may help people improve. Um, their performance in CVD prevention through the tools that we can develop within EMIS. So when I think about how practices or PCNs can tackle the issue of CVD prevention, we there's two ways of doing it. You can go looking for patients to call for screening, looking for patients who may have a condition that you've not coded properly, find patients who aren't being managed well, and then call all those patients in. So that's one way of doing it. And really that's through population search reporting. The other way of doing it is when you've got a patient sat there in front of you, whether they're there to see you because of their eczema, or whether they're sat there with the practice nurse having their annual review, or they're having their bloods taken with the healthcare assistant, or indeed an interaction with the, the reception team. Um, and it's that set of resources that is more useful for when the patient sat there in front of you. So we've got searches, we've got prompts, um, which are always opt-in. They're never activated in your system because not everybody likes pop-ups. And then we've got the clinical templates. And what I'll do is I'll just go through and explain some of these resources in a bit more detail. Um, so, yeah, CVD prevention is becoming more and more complex. Um, our patients have multiple conditions. That's the norm now. Um, but we need to make sure that we're, we're being effective and efficient when we're seeing these patients. And it's all about making the best use of the staff that you've got. Um, there's so much that we need to be doing for our patients these days. All the monitoring requirements that, you know, they're usually with the healthcare assistant or the practice nurse screening recalls from your admin team, the multiple referrals we need to do, and then the ever expanding list of medications that we can use to try and help manage patients, not just from a cardiovascular disease point of view, but from other point of views as well. So the CDRC has developed a suite of searches um, to help with screening and identifying patients um, with the ABC conditions. And this is just a snapshot of the brief few, brief searches that there are for atrial fibrillation. Um, screening, we, we look for patients who are at high risk of atrial fibrillation. Um, and this is obviously the top search. You know, we sh should make pulse checks the norm when people come in and ha are being reviewed by anybody. Um, especially if they're having their blood pressure taken, do a pulse check. If it's abnormal, do an ECG, get those patients identified with AF. Um, and then so the case finding uh, searches, um, such as if they're on medication for might be for AF. So you can see that this suite of searches might help you improve your identification of patients who are, have already been in to see you. Um, and there's obviously some management about anticoagulation uh, for those who need it. Hypertension, um, again, there's a suite of search trying to identify patients who may have hypertension that you haven't actually coded. Um, and the searches are always broken down into certain groups that you might want to target first. So you can see that these top ones, the screening priorities, are these are people who don't have a diagnosis of hypertension, but their last blood pressure reading is in one of these ranges. So you could come down to 140 over 90 and that'll be all of these. Or you could go, you know, actually, I should be tackling these ones first. You know, what's your blood pressure actually doing? Do you have hypertension? Um, and just with addressing the health inequalities, um, the searches usually are subsequently divided into your BIM population and your core 20 plus 5. So you, if you know that these are the ones who are hard to engage, you might use a different tact when trying to get those in for a repeat blood pressure in this case. Um, you might get a care coordinator calling them and explaining the importance where the others might simply be a text and you might get a response from them. 
and then obviously the the searches then go on you know if you've done home blood pressure monitoring monitoring ambulatory blood pressure monitoring but you've not coded them as hypertension search will pick up that um but then there's issues whether their blood pressure is not to target or whether it looks like they're not taking their medication and these searches can help identify all those patients lipids again there's a whole suite of searches for lipids and this looks quite scary when you first look at the entire lists but it's not actually too bad this first search here 1.0 that is simply a search that estimates a Q-risk. So the Q-risk calculation is quite complex behind the scenes with the, the different calculations as to how it calculates the risk. What we've done without actually calculating a Q-risk for all these patients is use that algorithm to try and identify all the patients who probably have a Q-risk over 10%. Um, and that's without having calculated a Q-risk. So that is this top one so this is who we think you should focus your screening on and they've got split up into people who are eligible to call for an nhs health check so that could be quite a simple one um if they're coming in for a long-term condition review anyway such as respiratory or epilepsy or something else you know they may they'll be eligible for a, a health check as well um and then more importantly is actually this group of patients in the 1.3 is their patients who are not eligible for an NHS health check who aren't going to be coming in for a long term condition review. So they're the patients that we're never actually going to call and try and invite into the surgery. So that search, that search is really, really good because these are the hidden patients. And that's what makes some of the searches really sensitive that the CDRC build because those patients are lost to recall or follow up uh, at surgeries. You know, we're, we're not going to see them, but we've got enough data to suggest that they do need something. And again, splitting into you, your BM and your core 20 plus 5 to help try and address your um, health inequalities. I think everybody's done familial hypercholesterolemia to death um, through the previous PCN DESs, so I'll not focus too much on those searches. But then there's a suite of searches again that look quite scary about who to consider starting lipid loin therapy. Um, and yes, secondary prevention, you know, they're not on lipid loin therapy. They've already had a condition. This search will pick up who needs who needs to be on lipid loin prevention. And this search will take into account if there's any exclusion criteria, so if they've got allergies or anything. So you're not going to be reviewing patients that you already know aren't suitable for lipid lowering prevention. And again, this list here looks quite scary, but this is really for primary prevention. And this just breaks it down so that you can focus who you're going to target. So just as Dr. Bethapudi said that we were looking at the targets for Q risk over 20% people who are treated with lipid lowering therapy. These searches can be focused so you know you can look for your highest Q risks first before you get down to your lowest ones. And then some of the other indications why people may be eligible for primary prevention anyway, because of their long term conditions. And then the more special searches about do we have a lipid target calculated? Um, has that lipid target been achieved? Do they need intensifying of the lipid loin therapy? And then the more detailed things about the more specialist medications that practice are, are becoming more aware of that may require a referral to secondary care. And that's if they're eligible for PCSK9 inhibitors or inclizarine. Some practices are doing inclizarine, um, some aren't, but when I show you some of the other resources, I'll explain that a bit more. So again, like I said, the searches are really sensitive um, and the, the, they're specifically identifying the relevant cohorts of patients that you might want to get in. Um, but based on those searches, you might have different members of staff who are going to contact those patients, um, be it a care coordinator, one of your reception team, um, healthcare assistant, practice nurse, or simply via your normal recall. You can use your own judgment as to how you would contact those different groups of patients. And it doesn't always have to be a GP sorting it, you know, utilize your practice teams. 
So that that kind of covers the the kind of proactive looking for these patients, getting them in, knowing who needs some intervention, who needs something done. But the next set of resources I'm going to show you are for patients who you might actually have sat in front of you or sat on the phone. One of the first tools that the CDLC has developed is a CDLC precision prevention overview. And we're all EMIS users, you'll be familiar with the Zap box. Um, but this is a really comprehensive alert. And it's called CDLC precision, CBD prevention. Um, and if you hover over it, you will get a comprehensive alert like this. And if there's exclamation marks, it's telling you something's not right. So quite quickly, you can glance down it and see. Obviously, with this test patient, there's lots of problems, um, but it's got your cholesterol targets. So it'll tell you whether the cholesterol target has been recorded or whether it's been achieved, whether they're meeting the nice blood pressure target, when the last blood pressure was, you know, if there's an issue with obesity, smoking, AF, whether there should be anticoagulated or whether they are on the wrong dose of anticoagulation, it'll tell you. Um, like I say, this is a bit comprehensive. I know we're focused on the ABCs, but it has the diabetic patients, um, whether they've had their urinary CRs, CKD misdiagnoses, whether their G codes, A codes are correct, vascular disease, whether they're on an antiplatelet or an anticoagulant, um, it'll highlight that, and also heart failure, um, whether they're coded correctly um, for the heart failure and depend on that, whether they've had an assessment of whether they're symptomatic, and whether, if appropriate, ACE inhibitors or beta blockers or SGLT2 inhibitors uh, are prescribed. So you can see it's quite a comprehensive overview in just one quick fly down um, that anybody can look at. You know, GPs can do it when we're consulting patients for, like I said, their eczema. The practice nurses can use it. Healthcare assistants can use it um, so they can get a quick overview and make that every contact count. You know, they're in for one thing, but look at that go, oh, actually, let's check your blood pressure. Oh, let's get your lipids up to date. Not everybody likes pop ups, but I have found this pop up quite useful and I've had good feedback from some, some surgeries and I'm, I'm waiting for some data to show how effective it's been um, at treating people's blood pressure to target. So this is a pop up that you can activate um, within your systems that will tell you when you load a patient's record whether their blood pressure is treated to target based on the last reading in the temp in, in the record. So it'll trigger if you're opening a record and the blood pressure is not to target. It'll trigger if you enter a blood pressure that's out with the target. Um, and it intelligent tells you what their targets are. Um, and also tells you whether they're eligible for NHS health check. Um, your quaff aged over 45 blood pressure every five years. It'll have that in as well. And it'll also potentially tell you whether somebody has enough data in the record to say that they have hypertension, but you haven't coded them. So it will it'll potentially alert you to undiagnosed hypertension in you with your patients as well. So they're the only two alerts that there really is. We've got the soft alert in the zap box that'll do give you a CVD prevention overview. And there's only a hard alert with a pop up that will come up for the blood pressure control. So then we come to the EMIS clinical templates that we've got. Um, and they're all really intelligent in the way that they're built. And there's a modular approach to it. So th these different modules or pages within the clinical templates are embedded within the Precision One Review template, which is the Practice Nurse Annual Review templates. And the healthcare assistants can use that as well for when they're reviewing patients but they're also included in a dedicated CVD prevention template. And the, I'm not going to show you all the pages, but this one, simple blood pressure in red writing, it says nice blood pressure target not achieved. So, you know, if, if you're in this record, you know, right, let's get your blood pressure checked and then you can, you can action that appropriately. 
Um, and then the next thing that I'm going to show you is actually the lipids template. So again, th th this, this presentation is about the ABC con conditions. So atrial fibrillation, the vast majority of everybody does atrial fibrillation really well once patients have been identified. Um, we've got the in your face pop up for blood pressure, um, but we also have a very an extremely intelligent template um, that helps guide you through lipid lowering. And this is this is something I, I'm extremely pleased of, which is why I've gone through the trouble of making the video. Um, one thing I will say about the video is that I made it just before the new nice guidance was released in December. Um, with regards to the um, secondary prevention non HDL cholesterol targets, but the template has been updated. But I'm hoping this will show you the patient's journey. Okay, so this patient, Billy Test, um, I already know he's eligible for primary prevention. His non HDL cholesterol is six, and his I think his cubus is 41. Um, but some of the things that we need to do for this patient is that we need to set a cholesterol target for him, which is a 40% reduction, prescribe a torvastatin, and then get his, his bloods repeated in three months time. So if we open that lipid template, looks very simple. This is what it looks like. At the test, it says, at the top, it says, primary prevention recommended is Q risks greater than 10. And you can see that actually here it was 42.1. And that's saying there's no cholesterol target and you really should be setting a cholesterol target. So as we said, this patient, we need to record his cholesterol target. So we'll do that. So 40% reduction from six would be 3.6. So we've added that to the record. We'll then prescribe some atorvastatin, 20 milligrams. And then we'll arrange for his repeat blood tests again in three months time. So fast forward three months and his repeat cholesterol has come down from six down to five, but we've still not achieved that cholesterol target of 3.6. So we know that we're going to need to increase the dose of a torvastatin to 40 milligrams and repeat those lipids again in three months time. So you see that when we open the template this time, and this is the exact same template, because of the intelligence behind it, it's changed. So it's now saying that in green, which is good, the patient's on primary prevention. But now this bit is saying the non-HDL target has not been achieved. And here it's telling you what you need to do next. So prescribe a statin, ensure the optimal dose is prescribed and titrate if appropriate. Um, so if we proceed to do that, so let's increase the atorvastatin to 40 milligrams. Um, so they're now on atorvastatin 40, fast forward three months and hooray, we've, we've reached his non-HDL cholesterol target. So there's nothing more we need to do. This, this patient's on primary prevention, 40 milligrams, and the target's been achieved. So if we then go to have a look at the template now, you'll see that it's changed again, and it's all nice and green. They're on primary prevention, non-HDL HDL target's been achieved, so there's, there's no further action to be done. However, because Billy Test is obese, he's a smoker, he's very inactive, despite us optimizing his primary prevention, he has had a heart attack now. So he's not on primary prevention anymore. He's on, he needs secondary prevention. So we know that that non-HDL target that we had calculated for him is now redundant because it's now 2.5, well, 2.6 on the new guidance, but for the sake of this video, it's 2.5. So secondary prevention, need to get him on 80 milligrams and repeat his bloods in three months time. So if we have a look at the template now, that he's had a heart attack. We'll see that saying he's actually on secondary prevention now because he's he's had the heart attack, so it's not primary prevention. We need to add the new target of 2.5, which you can see we're doing there. 
and we're going to continue and prescribe a torvastatin 80 milligrams because that's the standard dose for secondary prevention and we'll repeat his blood tests in three months time so he's on a torva 80 he's, he hasn't reached his new non-hdl cholesterol target so i know the next steps would be adding a zetamibe and repeat his blood tests in three months time so again if we go to the exact same template we'll see how it looks different and how it's changed and we'll see now again it says target's not been reached but now there's a new section down here that says the patient has prescribed statin medication and short optimal dose is prescribed and titrate if appropriate so we add the azetamibe because we know that's the next step to do. And we repeat his bloods in three months time. So unfortunately for Billy, he's still not met his target, but we need an LDL cholesterol to see if he's eligible for any of the other medications. And you'll see that down here now, the message is now is on statin azetamibe arrange fasting lipids for an LDL cholesterol. So we'll go ahead, arrange those fasting blood tests, and the results will come back. The non-HDL of 2.6 and LDL of 2.7. So he's now eligible for enclizoran. And again, if we go back to the exact same template, which is really intelligent and is adjusted to the record, it now says patients likely eligible for enclizoran. So that would be the next step in lipid lowering therapy. So we go ahead, prescribing clizoran, repeat his lipids in three months' time. And because this is a made up scenario, everything's perfect. You know, his, his non HDL cholesterol's in target and his LDL cholesterol's come down as well. So if you look at the, the Template again, it's all green. Secondary prevention, non HDL target reached, maximum lipid loin therapy prescribed. So, this lipid optimization resource um, is, is it's just the one template which is embedded in the other templates. It is embedded in the practice nurse annual review template, dedicated CVD prevention template. It guides on the cholesterol targets, it guides on the next steps in treatment, having distinguished between primary and secondary prevention, and intelligently reacts to investigations and medications to tell you what the next step in lipid modification would be. So that's a brief, well, actually that wasn't so brief. <laughs> um, so that's a demonstration of the resources we have for um, blood pressure and lipids. Um, and I hope you found it you found it useful. I suppose we can take any questions now, if anybody has any, or if you've all fallen asleep. I think uh, let's have a look. Barry has his hand up. Barry, thanks uh, very much for an excellent presentation. Um, certainly, the CDRC precision tool. Uh, I'll be taking a close look at that. I was surprised that you, uh, and this is a more of a therapeutic issue, I was surprised that you went for a zetamibe uh, as the first choice after Torvastatin 80 rather than in Clisseran because the potential could have been that you could have um, uh, not got the target but uh, put yourself outside of the eligibility of prescribing Clisseran. Do you want to comment on that? So the... The Inclizoran eligibility will appear at any point if they're eligible for Inclizoran. Um, the, the, that scenario that we worked through was just, for me, was a step-by-step -step approach to, sh to show what the template can do. Um, if at any point the criteria, the eligibility criteria for Inclizoran is met, the, the, the section will appear to say they may be eligible for Inclizoran. 
Yes, thank you. I'm just worried that the new NICE guidelines uh, might put a lot of people outside of, of, of the uh, criteria for prescribing cholesterol if you're using uh, zetamibe as they're suggesting uh, first line after the yeah. talks. Thank you. I think we've got um, a question in the chat that's come through from Catherine asking, should we be using Curis 2 or Curis 3? So you can use either. Um, Curis 2 is embedded within EMIS. Um, our, my personal opinion is, is that if we start telling people they have to use QRISC 3 and they have to go to an external system input about 20 different criteria, to calculate the Q risk, they're not going to do it. It's too busy. It's too time consuming. It's not going to happen. It's perfectly perfectly acceptable to be using Q risk two. The hope would be that with EMIS will integrate Q risk three um, into their calculations. Um, yeah, so that's the hope. Absolutely, Andy. Best to stick to Q risk two at the moment, given that it's system integrated. Uh, Lindsay has a hand up. Yeah, it was just a quick one. We've got EMIS practice, but we can't find the template. Um, so we, if you go to the is on the, the CDRC website, it'll show you how to how to utilize the CDRC resources. Um, if you've got any difficulties doing that, by all means, um, give me give myself an email. Um, or Ben Moll uh, at AHSN. We'll, we'll get his contact details added to the end of the slides and sent over as well. Just to add to that, um, these will not automatically be in your EMS. You have to import them from the CDRC. So if you go look at, uh, for these on your so, EMS, unless your practice has activated them, which so, not everybody has, I believe. The vast majority of practices and CCGs do have access to these. Um, there's a new way of working with regards to accessing the CDRC resources. Um, so they're not immediately searchable within the templates, um, but there's, there's a guide on the website about how to access the CDRC resources. So they, they will be in your system, but just hidden at the moment. Any more questions? Feel free, pop in the chat, pop your hands up. Andy, um, more for clarity for the group. Uh, so when nurses do long term condition reviews, that's the ideal time to pick this up, particularly yeah. for people who are not treated to target. Um, so really, I mean, I don't know how many in this audience are practice nurses, but uh, uh, it'd be helpful to know from the audience if you feel that a session to practice nurses would be helpful as well, because they usually are the ones. I mean, we opportunistically pick them up. But the long term condition reviews are run by them. Do people think that they, it would be helpful to have a similar uh, demonstration to nurses as well? Just a thought and a comment. I, I suppose every practice works differently. You know, you have nurse prescribers. Um, so practice nurses will get the chronic disease review bloods, they'll get the lipids, they'll see it, they'll know that titration is needed and prescribe where the other practices you know, GPs may process the results. And, you know, it's just important to educate the GPs um, about these resources and knowing what to do with non-HDL targets. Because um, sometimes that is the barrier. Sometimes GPs aren't familiar, um, but also them knowing how to um, escalate lipid lowering therapy. But more than happy to do a session for anybody and everybody. Uh, I think Kristen, did you have a question or was it answered? Uh, it was, I think it was answered. I was just, sorry, hi, just trying to find um, on the website. Um, but I couldn't find the website, but now I found it because it's on your screen. <laughs> um, really? But I was just looking to see where, is it under resources that we yeah, so resources. if you click on resources, there'll be an EMIS and system one. Obviously, we'll yeah. click EMIS. Um, and, then, and then and then that will have the video that tells you how to download them. Thank you. 
Yeah. Um, and in answer to your other question, so certainly in our PCN, it's mostly the pharmacists who are doing most of this work. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, so I, I do think, I don't know how many of them are on this call, but um, it would be great to do some training and, and with the practice nurses, I think. But you're right, yeah. start with the GPs. So that, that's why we developed a, a, yes, all these pages are embedded in the nurse annual review template, um, which is called CDOS Precision One Review. But that's why we developed a CVD prevention template as well, which has those pages, but excludes the other pages that the practice nurse would be doing for like asthma or what have you. Um, and that's because we were aware that everybody works differently and we may have pharmacists who would just want to look at this one template if they're doing CBD prevention clinic. Um, I know some pharmacists will just do blood pressure and some will just do lipids, um, but in an ideal world you'd have well, I was doing this, take, taking a holistic CVD prevention view and doing both blood pressure and lipids. I think uh, Richard has a question. Oh, I just, sorry, I didn't realize I wasn't muted. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of, is there an easy way to see the targets if a target's been put on there? I'm just thinking with regards to sort of on seeing bloods on call. And yeah. if there's an easy way to rather than opening a template up just to kind of just a quick glance whether they've hit target or not. So that zap box that I told you about with yeah. Um, if you hover over that, which is what I do with when I'm processing blood uh, blood results and lab results, is if I get a set of lipids, I immediately go to that, hover over it, and then I'll see whether the non-HDL target has been met. And it does pull in the provisional result before it's been filed. That, that sounds great. Is that, that's a separate thing to download that's outside the template from from the website, presumably. Yeah, so it's a protocol that you can activate yourself um, to have that alert in the zap box. And again, there's guidance on the CDRC website about how to activate that. That's great. Thanks for that. No problem. I think there's a question just popped from the chat from Yvonne. Uh, can tech search under investigation slash care history to search for target if might be easy if you read it Andy if you've got the channel. Well oh, Yvonne's just given advice to Richard oh, right, there about how to find the target. Right. Real. Any more for any more? So pop in the chat or feel free pop your mic off mute. Yeah, perfect. So, so ju just to summarize, thank you, Andy. Thank you. That that that's very helpful. And uh, as Jack was mentioning earlier, if you want to uh, keep plugged in with the CBD network on the latest webinars and and how to make life easy for yourself from a CBD point of view, uh, please drop a line to Jack. And if you have a a bunch of pharmacists, uh, practice nurses who you think uh, uh, we we could do this training for, just again drop a line to Jack. It probably is usually uh, given that the the the, the resources is, is minimal. It would be helpful if you can group yourself a group bunch of practices, PCMs getting together and then asking us to to do a webinar. We're more than happy to work around your availability. So yeah, the more the merrier. If that is it, if I can't see any more questions, thank you all very much. Thank you, Andy, in particular for. Uh, raising the profile of CBD and uh, particularly using CDRC resources. Thank you all very much. It's been great. Cheers. See Thank you. you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Cheers.